we decided that we'd like to do something more Hamish when it came to memori memorializing those who fought and perished and survived in the Holocaust. It's all right, you can just put them on vibrate. So, um, unfortunately, all of our members that were survivors have passed on, but they have also more than just passed on. They passed on their legacy to their children and their grandchildren. It's up to us, the children, to remember and make others remember and know about what happened during those extremely fateful six years. So we have a interesting program this evening and uh, there will be three, pr four presentations altogether. The first one will be Mimi Fissel, the second one will be Toby and Sandy, and uh, the third one will be Dr. Eldad Bialaki. Each one of them will speak about the vicissitudes of their parents during the, those fateful years. And the fourth one will be presentation by Dr. Isaac Amon, will talk about the fateful, extremely fateful and interesting story of the Jews of Greece in Saloniki. Without, uh, I would like to now introduce uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Logopolsky will say a few words of introduction. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. A very special thank you to Menachem for putting together this very important and meaningful program. Thank you to all our presenters this evening. And thank you all for coming. We come together on Yom HaShoah. We honor the memory of the six million Kedoshim, the six million martyrs, brutally murdered al Kiddush Hashem. We remember the heroism of those who were killed and those who survived You know, if I would miss a lunch one day, I'd be hungry, I'd be in a cranky mood. My wife gives me a long shopping list and you can't find the particular product that she asked for, a very specific product. You get frustrated, you get in a bad mood. Can we even imagine what spending one day in a concentration camp was like. The physical, the mental, and emotional toughness of those who endured the horrors of the camps day in and day out is simply mind-boggling. We look back where we were as a people 78, 80 years ago. We were broken, we were beaten, we were a demoralized people. But look now, these years later, how we bounce back. Look at where we are today. Look at how we as a nation have flourished. Every shul, every synagogue, Every yeshiva, every day school, every mikvah that has been built is another victory over Hitler, Yamach Shemova Zichro. Every Jewish baby, every bris, every bar mitzvah, every Jewish wedding, every mitzvah that a Jew does, every time a Jew walks into shul is yet another victory over Hitler, Yamash, Shemel, Zichro. Of course, we take the time to contemplate what was, 
We are sad and we cry and we mourn over what was lost. Every single one of the six million Kedoshim was a world unto itself. There were a couple of survivors who I knew quite well. One was a Jew, Herschel Epstein, who lived in Zalashitz in Poland, who survived five years of concentration camps. He passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 97. And he told me that he, not a night goes by where he doesn't wake up without nightmares. I just got off the phone a few minutes ago from a survivor, Mrs. Livia Horowitz, who lives in North Belmore, Long Island, where I used to live. And to this day, she can't get over the losses that she endured. And yes, we are sad and we mourn and we cry and we remember what was. But at the same time, we also take great pride in the unbreakable faith and the triumphant spirit of our holy nation. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Nini Fazel, and I stand before you deeply affected by not only one, but two survivors of the Holocaust. In 1995, I urged my parents to tell their stories to Steven Spielberg's Shoah Project. And on June 27th, 1996, they were individually interviewed and filmed. In the past 27 years, since then, I was never able to watch their testimonies until now. This is the first time their stories, although abbreviated, are being told to an audience. Their stories are quite different, but equally horrific. My mother, Basha Bess, they called her here, Gert, was born on February 12th. 1920. <clears throat> the eldest of four children, her sister Paula and brothers Morris and Abraham. <clears throat> her father was quite a religious man, who was a quiet religious man, who was a, a cap maker and had a stall in the lunch ghetto, uh, the lunch marketplace. Her mother, Mendla, who I'm named after, was a strong, capable woman who sold the caps and held the family together. They, were, they lived in three-room apartment in the outskirts of the city and had a close, tight-knit family with many aunts, uncles, and cousins. Only two cous first cousins survived. They were poor, so my mother went to public school, graduating from seventh grade. They lived a happy life with hardly any knowledge of what was going on in Germany. On Rosh Hashanah in 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. When they came into Lodz, Poland's second largest city, they started building a ghetto in a section of the city surrounded by fences and German guards. In 1940, they rounded up all the Jews in the city and surrounding areas and forced them into moving into the ghetto. My mother's family of six were moved into one room with the bathroom, out, the outdoor toilets, and daily a ration of watery, what they called soup, and a piece of bread. That was all they got every day. She was forced to work tearing down homes and buildings. The work was difficult, and she was hungry and tired. In June 1942, she watched her father, my grandfather, die of starvation in the ghetto. And she never did knew where his body was taken, so she didn't know where he was born, uh, buried or burned. Uh, the entire four years in the ghetto, her family lived in fear. The Germans tortured and killed Jews every day. In 1944, the Germans liquidated the ghetto 
And one night the SS came banging on the door and took only my mother away. She was roughly herded onto a cattle car at the rail station with a hundred other young Jewish, uh, with a hundred, hundred other young Jews, shoulder to shoulder, packed in like sardines with no food, water, or sanitation in the stifling August heat, not knowing where they were going. This is exactly what I saw in the movie Shoah. And I can't believe my mother went through that. This harrowing experience is something she would never forget. She talked in, the, in her testimony, on, she talked about that being something in the back of her mind always. Uh, she wasn't sure how long she traveled because there was no day or night and time had no meaning. So she thought it might have been two or three days it took to get from Ludge to Auschwitz. The train finally stopped and the door slid open and she was pushed out and it was, she was in Auschwitz. They shoved everyone out and that was still alive and they collected the dead bodies of whoever died on that train in the cattle car that had fallen to the floor uh, when the cattle cars were empty. They were immediately formed into men's lines and women's lines. Her belongings were taken away. Her head was shaved. She had to strip and she was taken away to showers to be deloused and cleaned up. The stench was unspeakable. The SS gave her a uniform and some wooden shoes and assigned them to a barracks with wooden bunk beds. Every day the Germans tortured and killed the Jews. My mother was forced to be counted multiple times a day, standing in line for hours in the rain and the snow with very little clothing and these wooden shoes <laughs> that were open. Um, if you t spoke to or turned to someone, look at someone, you were shocked. If someone was missing, you would stand in line the entire day until they were found. And then they would shoot or hang the per perpetrator in front of everyone to make sure they all knew the consequences. <laughs> Every day Jews were being brought to Auschwitz from all over Europe to be murdered. So my mother was only there two weeks with no time to be tattooed with a number on her. Another horrible cat -a car trip, this time to Bergen-Belsen. Then when she arrived there, she met someone who knew what happened to her family, who arrived in Auschwitz just as she was leaving, they were coming. Her mother <clears throat> was selected to go to the gas chamber and her three siblings were not. Her little brother Abraham didn't want to leave his mother and ran to her. They were gassed to death together. Abraham was seven and her mother was 42. As in Auschwitz and as in Auschwitz and in Bergen-Belsen was, was a similar routine. No work, watery soup and bread, being counted all the time and watching people die and hoping and praying that, it, that she wouldn't. After six weeks of being in Bergen-Belsen, there was another selection. Rumors around the camp said one line would be going to a work camp and the other would be going to a death camp. She decided to sneak into the line she thought would be and hoped was going to the work camp. Another horrible cattle car ride trip. She arrived in Salzvale, a work camp a miracle. She was assigned to work making bullets in a munitions factory with local Germans. <laughs> Everywhere my mother went, there was always another Jew assigned to watch them. <laughs> Sometimes the Jews were worse than the Germans because they were afraid too of dying. This was 1945, and one day in April, the woman, the women in her barracks woke up in silent, to silence. They were afraid to leave and go outside because they didn't know what was going on. Uh, after a while, they did, only, they did, and only 
to find out that all the German soldiers had fled and the gates were open. People were running out of the camp not knowing where to go. My mother ran into town going uh, into an abandoned store, gathering up as much food and milk as she could and brought it back to everyone in the camp. Starving, these people were starving. Many ate too much and got sick. Some even died. Um, soon the British Army came in and told them they were free and help was coming. The Americans came next and set up kitchens and were taking care of the ill as much as they could. And after a short time, my mother, feeling stronger, wanted to find out, find where her family was and if anybody survived. And she took a train to Salzheim, a displaced persons camp that the Americans set up that was right um, outside of Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, there she met up with her sister, Paula, and her brother, Morris, the only two that survived. Um, and that's where she met and married my father. And I was born there, uh, 1948. I want to tell you my father's story, which is very different than my mother's, and um, but just as horrific. Uh, my father, Simcha Sam Fazell, was born on February 28, 1919, in Benjamin, Poland. He was one of six children, Maltek, Leibel, Sandek, Dora, and Miriam. His father, Herschel, was a hauler of merchandise or people, he took people to, like a cabbie or, or a truck driver, all in goods. He was strict and tough. His mother, Haya, whom I'm also named after, was a homemaker who was popular and was very friendly. Everyone in town knew her. Uh, they were religious and had a huge, extended, tight-knit family. My grandfather, um, my father's father, had 11 brothers and sisters, and his mother had nine. So there were 20 aunts and uncles. They were all married and had children, lots of children, so it was a big family. Uh, they were relatively poor, and my father went to public school and graduated from seventh grade also. After graduation, graduating, his mother's cousin took him into his, his their very successful ladies' dress shop to learn to be a tailor. He learned to make suits and dresses until the war broke out. Ben Dean was, uh, ben Jean was only six kilometers from the German border, and the Germans were there, invaded their town in three hours after the war, <laughs> after the war started. Uh, his two brothers, Maltel and Lago, were soldiers in the Polish army, um, which fled as soon as the Germans came in. They, they, the Polish army just, you know, disappeared. They were not <laughs> not uh, able to fight against the huge German army. His these two uh, brothers, Mato and Maibo, were old, the oldest brothers. So my father was 20 when the war broke up. Nick Rapp broke out, and he was. They were much older, um, in their late, in the late to mid 20s. Um, his brother Lyle was killed on Rosh Hashanah just two weeks after the Germans occupied his town. It was a much smaller town, which was much bigger, you know, and uh, that was the family's first tragedy. The Germans liked to kill Jews on Jewish holidays, and on Rosh Hashanah, my father watched as they gathered 200 Orthodox Jews to the marketplace, made them put their black coats over their heads and shot them. There was so much anti-Semitism in Ben Dean that no Jew was safe. The Poles collaborated with the Germans almost immediately. In, fate, in January of 1940, my father was taken right off the street and transported with hundreds of other young men to Scheibusch, one of the six work camps that he would be sent to during the war. My father was 20 years old and young and strong, and the Germans needed him to do backbreaking work so the young Germans could go off to fight. In Saibush, he worked 
long hours breaking down the buildings on the farms around the camp. One time he strayed on the, off the walk to work to pick up a few potatoes in the farmer's field and he got caught. He was beaten with a two by four, but didn't complain because he did, he did, he, he, if he did, he would be sent to death camp. From Cyberg there, the commandant was not too harsh. They, um, he allowed the letters, to, uh, the letters from home uh, to come in and they were able to write some letters too. I never saw any letters, so I don't know what happened to him if my father wrote any. Um, he went, from there he went to Annenberg, Annenberg, where he worked in a uniform, uniform and wooden shoes also, 16 hours a day, mixing concrete and loading heavy bags of gravel. There was little food, soup made out of carrot leaves and a small square Bread. No more letters or communication from home anymore. There was no rest or food in Annenberg. After several months, they asked if anyone wanted to go to another camp to work, and my father volunteered. He was sent to Klettendorf. There he worked tearing up tracks at the railway station. Klettendorf was the worst, my father said. All day we were required to carry scraps of iron tracks. They were breaking up the railroad tracks, digging up, and he, um, and stacked them in an open warehouse. Only the short people survived. The tall people died because their backs would actually break. These things were like 50 tons, um, very, very heavy. And after six months in Klettendorf, he and two friends uh, that he was with from Ben Dean, Ben Jean, went to Graditz, where they came, lived in a sugar factory and had to walk 12 kilometers to work in a brick factory. Loading bricks onto the truck, onto trucks, he worked the, for several months and, and, and at another camp, which he didn't elaborate on, was Fowlbrook, there where he went. After that, finally he was sent to Rachenbach, where he worked in a large factory with local Germans. He caught typhoid fever, and a German bricklayer who he worked with, um, not a soldier, uh, brought him aspirin, which, he, which saved his life. Hundreds of people died of typhoid overnight in the camp, and many of were his friends. This was a death camp he survived. This was the death camp he survived. Breakfast was brought to them in the morning, and he took the food of those who died overnight so he could live. He later learned his brother Sandik had walked for weeks from another camp to Graditz, but they weren't letting them in because of the typhoid. Every day they had carts and loaded up the dead bodies to bury them or burn them. One morning he was feeling better and went to wash up in the washroom and it was filled with dead bodies which he had to walk over to get to the water. This was not the only time he was lucky to survive. In 1942 his knees were badly injured and his knees were so badly swollen that he was selected to be deported and an SS soldier who knew him from previous camps didn't let him didn't let them take him. He saved my father three times from deportation. He knew that he was a good worker, he was a strong worker, and he, he, um, he wanted him to get better and work. Um, my father was lucky many times and survived. He was liberated from, uh, I can't even, you know, he was liberated May 8th, 1945 by the, the Russian army uh, from that sixth camp, work camp that he was in. Um, my father's lost hundreds of relatives and only one sister, Dora, and one brother, Sandek, survived. And I never had grandparents. Um, my father 
left there and um, went to Germany, you know, have, tried to pass through the borders and, uh, and the uh, American uh, guards that were there at the rail stations wouldn't let them pass and they had to go back and forth quite a few times. He and his brother uh, and uh, the friends that he had and some cousins that would survive. So uh, finally they got through and uh, they um, went to Salzheim. That's where he met my mom. They got married in 1946 and uh, they went to France that were my, some of my father's uh, aunts and cousins survived. They went to Africa, actually. They went to Morocco, a French colony, and they went. They were there through the whole war, and then when they came back to France, um, that's when my dad and my mom uh, went there, and they got married there. They got married twice, actually. Once on February 12th, which is my mom's birthday, and uh, next time uh, in France uh, uh, on May, in May sometime. But they considered February 12th their anniversary, and uh, the whole city came to their. <laughs> they lived my uh, their uh, my dad's aunts and uh, uncles lived in Metz outside of Paris, and uh, there were 300 people at their wedding. They said so. It was uh, you know they were very happy to see them and that they they lived so. Uh, I, I have no pictures of my mother's family at all, not one. I have several pictures of my father's side, um, his mother, his grandmother, and, uh, and the, you know, the, the kids, the six kids when they were little. So um, that's all. I'm glad that I got through this. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. listening. are here and I know many of you. Tonight we're here um, to talk about my father, Abe Dobin, who was a member of this show. And some of you personally knew him. I can honestly say if you did not know him, you missed out on the pleasure of knowing a truly wonderful spirit of a man. We are here to share with you what a child might endure through the years into adulthood and what choices one has when living in a time of uncertainty. Many of you were probably brought up in a family that talked about um, whether it was your parents or grandparents and about their experience throughout the Holocaust and what they endured. But in our family, we did not. We grew up and our father purposely kept this information from us. We would hear bits and pieces from other relatives, uncles, telling us about our father and he belonged to many congregations and refugees he would talk to, Yiddish and Hebrew, and we would catch parts of it. So we would hear little bits, and he had many nightmares when we were growing up. So I would hear him scream out in his sleep. And of course we'd ask our mother, and she would fill us in on little bits and pieces. But because he wanted to keep it from us, we didn't want to ask questions either, because we thought, such a horror that he's going through, we didn't want to bring up these memories with him. And we thought we were protecting him as well as he was protecting us. So, although um, the screaming and the sleeping, of course, over here in conversations, we learned more. And then in turn, we would approach subjects with him out of, you know, just talking about little things he might bring up. But as adults, we as his children began to inquire more and more, and he not only opened up and shared much more about his experiences, but once he lost my mother, his beloved wife, the floodgates just opened up. And he wanted to tell the world and everyone who would listen about himself and his family that perished in the Holocaust. And we are here today to share his story with you.
next. So how do you explain the unexplainable? Um, where did they go? There you go. Okay. Um, I just want to say before I start that Mimi was talking, and so much of it was very similar um, to what my dad had experienced. My mom was born in the United States, and he met her here, so she was not a survivor. Um, but what she said, you know, that she just found the courage to listen to the Steven Spielberg's um, Shoah interview. Um, I think both of us would agree that um, my dad's interview was done in 1997, and it wasn't until just the past few days that we were really able to listen to his taped interview. Um, so if someone had asked me, you know, what did your dad go through? I'm not sure I could have said what he went through because he never spoke about it. And so we're here to relay some of the information from his interview. And then when I was in college um, many years ago, um, I took a re religion course and interviewed him. And it was really hard to get him to speak about it. Um, and I really had to work hard. And finally he did, and we had a taped conversation. But I had not reviewed that information for 40 plus years. So this is my dad, um, and this is his story. Um, he was born Abram L.J. Dobrzynski. Um, his name that all of you knew was Big Dobrzynski. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, our father was born in Orzakow, Poland on January 23rd, 1923. His father, Aaron Dobrzynski, his mother, Toba Dobrzynski, that I was named after. He had one brother, Simcha Dobrzynski, and one sister, Esther Mendel. And all of them perished in the Holocaust. He was the only survivor. So in the beginning, as Mimi said about her parents, you know, they had a pretty normal uh, beginning. Um, he had a brother, a sister, grandparents, cousins, friends. They were frequently visiting each other. Um, he would say his family was observant, and every week they prepared for the Shabbos like all Jewish families did in his town. Um, he did say that you know, if there was a stranger or a person that didn't have a home, they were invited into um, his family's home to join them for the Sabbath meal. Um, Dad said on Friday you could smell um, the cooking in the air, the chicken soup, um, a lot of the people would go to the market and get fish. They would cook, cook that. Everyone in town was preparing. They were not, um, they were poor. And so they just had dirt floors. But he said on the Sabbath, um, they would put down white sand on the dirt floors. And my grandfather was a tailor, so he would take a white sheet and turn it into a tablecloth. And they would put that on the table. Um, they had one pair of silver candlesticks that were set on the table for Shabbos and they all enjoyed a beautiful meal together. They really knew no other way of life. Um, the, the thing I wanted to say about the candlesticks is he, in the interview we found out that he said that when they had to leave their home, um, that his parents apparently, or I'm not sure exactly when, but they buried the can one candlestick, set of candlesticks. And he said, he laughed on the interview, he said, they're probably still there. there. <laughs> so we thought that was funny. So I'm gonna turn it over to my sister, Sandy. Yeah. He shared the first time he remembered hearing about Hitler in power was about 1933. His family, who was poor, did not have a radio, but their neighbors had a radio and they would listen through the window. By 1939, many German soldiers invaded his small town of Arzako, Poland, where he was born. All the Jews were forced to wear armbands with the Jewish star on them and were restricted by a 6 p.m. curfew or they would be shot on the spot. He, start, he stated the Germans would burn down the synagogues. That was the first thing they did when they came into town. And they took the houses from the Jews for themselves, leaving many homeless to find other shelter. In 1941, he told us the Germans went to the Jewish council in the town and asked them to provide 200 men to send to labor camps. And the council gave them, they gave them a quota to meet at a certain date. They couldn't meet that quota. So the Germans started taking men and young boys off the street and began loading them on trucks and taking them away from their families. My father happened to be one of these young men. 
He was only 12 years old at this time. He was taken from his mother off the streetcar. She begged and she screamed and she cried, please don't take my son. They would not listen. The last memory my father had was of his mother begging and crying for him not to go. But that was the last memory he could remember. Um, next. Oh yeah, thank you. I remember our father telling us he knew he had to survive. He must stay quiet, listen and obey all commands. He saw with his own eyes, if he didn't, he knew what would happen to him. He would be killed. And he saw this happen over and over again to friends and other men. The first labor camp he was sent to was in Lodz, Poland, a city in central Poland. From here, he was sent to many labor camps and multiple concentration camps that were run by the SS. Below, I've listed the camps. I, I won't even attempt to say them. By 1944, many of the Jews were taken from labor camps without warning and were transported to the concentration camps. And within four months, all of the prisoners were liquidated to concentration camps. There were thousands and thousands of people. Our father was sent to camp in Lativa, Poland. There, there were men and women for the first time, but they immediately separated them into lines. And he said the guards shaved everyone's heads and they were all put into striped clothing with wooden shoes. There was very little food, as Mimi had said. They would just throw potatoes in some water and give them a piece of bread. People were starving, but they made them work, no matter how weak they were, building bunkers and rebuilding buildings the Americans had bombed. My father felt this was the end, that he would never survive. They heard only German propaganda, and no country could stop them. Next. Not long after this camp, our father was sent to his next camp, Stokhoff. We were only here for a week, he said, and then they were shipped far away to Buchenwald. He said he would work on the Zeitz, which are chemical plants. They make gasoline and coal. When the Americans bombed this factory, and they did many times, they made them, um, they made them rebuild the walls and the factory. Again, at this time, many years had passed, four years, he was 16 years old by then. He knew he had to keep up with the strong men to stay alive. They worked many hours each day, from six in the morning until nine o'clock at night. Again, they would just get some watery soup and a piece of bread. The prisoners, they tried to comfort each other by talking and singing songs. But once the lights were turned off, they were not to make a sound or they would be killed. The guards were mean, but a few were nice, he said. Most would hit and kick and beat people and tell them if they didn't like it, they would be next. Our father would encounter a few men from his town at Buchenwald, and this is when he learned of his family's fate. His mother, father, and his sister and brother were all sent to the gas chamber. He still was determined to be the sole survivor of this ordeal. Buchenwald not only had the gas chambers, but they had the crematoriums to burn the bodies. Our father personally only had to go through a selection line twice, one book and wall. This is where they decided he could live or die by the gas chamber. He stated, if you were getting older, or you were a troublemaker, or you were weak, or the guards just didn't like you, this was the end of your life. Once we asked our father why so many did not try to escape, and he said, where was there to run? Who are they gonna fight with? We have no weapons. Fight with who? Fight how? In Buchenwald, he said there were Jewish stars on uniforms. There were political prisoners as well who wore red triangles, a socialist prisoners who had black triangles, and criminals had green triangles. And the criminals were treated the best out of everybody, especially the Jews. My father had the Jewish star, and on his uniform, he had his number, which he still remembers. At 74, it was 83175. He will never forget that number, he said. 
for working in Book and Wall, the Americans were getting closer and the bombs were coming more frequently. A bomb came so close to him that he ran for cover in the closest building he could find. Other prison, the bell, I'm sorry, the building collapsed on him. Other prisoners started pulling off the bricks and the rocks to get him out. And there he sustained some facial injuries and his knee was crushed. He was taken to the hospital in the camp and within days the camp was to be evacuated. They said, we have to go now. And if those who could not get up in the hospital are moved now, they were killed. He knew he had to get up. He knew he had to move. And he said he jumped up and started hopping. And other um, prisoners started helping him. They had to run. And he took all his strength to, to get moving. The guards took us to the train stations and they put us on cattle cars. And this is where they were taken to the Czechoslovakian border. Buchenwald was evacuated in 1945, and this was the last concentration camp our father was in prison. But once the Germans took the prisoners to Czechoslovakia, they were put into the ghettos for the Jewish people. This is where the Germans planned to exterminate all of them. The Germans had bunkers made in tunnels where they would put everyone, and they would fill them up with gas to kill the people. But when his group arrived, the Germans had no time because the Russians were there. And this is when he was liberated from the Nazis. Although the Russians kept them in the ghettos due to fear with so many being weak and sick, having typhoid, they were afraid to let them mix with the rest of the population and spread the sickness. Many died of high fevers from the typhoid. And her father as well was a victim to this sickness. But again, he pulled through and survived through it all. And there were thousands and thousands of these ghettos. He spent four years there and then heard from others. If you had a family member, somebody in the American zone, you could go visit them. You could ask for a pass. So he told them he knew somebody in the American zone and he would like a pass. They gave him one. He took the opportunity to leave and he never returned. Although he did not know anybody there. In 1949, after leaving the ghetto, our father uh, knew that he had a grandmother in the United States, and he knew that she lived in St. Louis. An American soldier, an officer, help, offered to help him find his relative in America. The officer did some research and found out that dad's grandmother had died in 1945 but she had had a brother who was also living in the United States and dad started writing him letters with the help of a soldier. The son of his relative would write back and they filled out papers for dad to come to the United States. Um, once he was approved, um, he had to wait uh, to be allowed to board a ship to his new destination. He first arrived in New Orleans on July 3rd and overnight they took a train to St. Louis. Once he arrived, there was no one there to meet him at the train station, um, and someone from the Jewish Family Services um, called to see where they were, um, because dad came on a private, his uncle sponsored him, whereas the Jewish Family Services brought groups of people. Dad was separate from that. Um, he, didn't, he didn't know who was coming to meet him, um, but he did recognize his cousin from a photo, um, which he had sent. Our father was grateful when he came to the United States. He worked hard to learn the American way as well as he learned how to speak English. Um, his uncle took him almost immediately to enlist in the army and the people of the army said, uh, he needs to be here for a little bit longer and speak the language. He doesn't even know how to speak English. So um, my, my dad's uncle helped him find a job and um, there was a lady from dad's hometown who actually gave him a job cutting pieces for handbags. Uh, he worked there until he was actually drafted into the United States Army in 1951. Um, even though he wasn't a US citizen, he served in the military. He was put on a boat and went back to Germany after his basic training. He joined a medical corps because his knee was still injured and he couldn't really walk well. Um, he joined a medical corps, it was a MASH unit. They sent him to school for 16 weeks to be a medical technician. And he was 
on the interview, he said he scored in the 90s. He passed with flying colors. Um, he did very well, and they put him um, with an ambulance company. So he drove an ambulance. But more than that, they did simulations because they thought that they were going to go to war, and so they had to quickly set up hospitals in record time, and he was uh, relaying that they could set up an entire hospital with services in three hours. Um, they thought they were going to war with Russia, so they repeatedly had these drills. He was in Germany for 16 months. He was then discharged and came back to St. Louis in August of 1953. He went back to work at the factory, and he was promoted to a foreman. These are pictures of just, this is his naturalization papers um, on October 21st, 1949. And we didn't have any pictures of his family, and these are the only pictures that we um, In October 1953, our father met my mom, um, his beloved wife, and they married on March 21st, 1954. He went on to take over my mother's kosher poultry business, Becker's Poultry, and then um, his remaining career for more than 30 years was working as a foreman at Levin Brothers Kosher Poultry in St. Louis until he retired. He continued to work and volunteer at the Jewish Community Center until his passing in August of 2013. Um, he created a beautiful family, which was his dream. He lost everyone and he wanted to rebuild his family, so he had five children. Um, he has nine, had nine grandchildren and nine children. In January of 1954, um, he actually changed his name because his uncle said, you really won't get anywhere with a name like that, so you better change your name. So he changed it to Dobin. Um, and at the same time, he became a U.S. citizen. And I'm seeing he's gonna close. Our father was showed so much love and patience and supported us, showed, showed us so much love and patience, supported us his whole life. He um, let us live our dreams as we chose to do so. He never pushed us or praised us, uh, but he praised us in our accomplishments and we always knew he was proud of us. I can honestly say he was one of the happiest people I knew and the most loving to everyone. It did, not, it did not matter whether it was your religion, color, origin, or beliefs. He was accepting and made you feel his love and acceptance. Most of all, we all knew how proud he was of his family and how much he loved us. Although he worked many hours throughout the week while we were growing up to provide for his family and we never saw him very much, he made sure to spend all his weekends with us, making memories and spending time with us to remind us of these memories for a lifetime, and for that we're grateful. As he would say if he was here today, God bless you and stay well. That was his favorite saying. Thank you for listening to us and letting us share his story today. <laughs>
secular and religious. Um, even though during the Inquisition and, and, and so forth, some uh, I believe primarily uh, Ashkenazi Jews were residing in Poland. Um, of course, there was a Hasidic movement. There was a, a Zionistic movement. Uh, Germ uh, I'm sorry, Poland was rather part partitioned, fractured state for many uh, hundreds of years. I believe in the 1800s, despite this, Jewish merchants were uh, becoming very uh, big drivers of the Polish economy. They were philanthropists. There were major synagogues built. There were Yiddish theaters. Jews, I guess, were in government. And uh, in 1918, um, Poland got uh, its borders back and, and became an independent country. Um, that's around the you know, end of World War I. Um, but the, the leaders thereafter were primarily um, protecting minorities from what I read. This is, of course, we have to understand with periods of difficulty, but in general, the, uh, by the 1939, when the um, World War II started, um, there were 3.3 million Jews in Poland. Um, that's about 10% of the population. Compare that to today in the United States, there's 2.4% Jews in the United States. So it was a very large part of the community there. Um, I'm not sure this is all accurate, but they represented up to a third of the doctors and, uh, and a fourth of the students and 10% of the military. Um, September 1st, Germany invades and, uh, and immediately there were anti-Semitic laws, um, of course, the ghettos and, and a final solution was enacted and by the end of the war, 3 million of the 3.3 million Jews, and these are numbers, obviously it's hard to imagine, uh, perished. So only 380,000, and I, please excuse if these are not 100% accurate, just what I read, 380,000 uh, Jews survived in Poland. So um, if you were a Jew in Poland in 1939, you had about a one in nine, sorry, one in 10 chance of of being alive after the war, which is remarkable. So my family dates back to Poland. They lived in cities such as Katowice and Benin and, and uh, Tarnow. Um, uh, both sides, they were jewelers, they were businessmen, they were property owners. On my mother's side, um, uh, my grandmother uh, survived primarily from her father taking her on a business trip to Palestine and uh, she didn't know that she was not coming back with him, so he was kind of uh, ahead of the game. Um, my grandfather on my maternal side survived. He, he was not a big speaker, so I don't really know his story, but I believe he was in the Polish army and was uh, through, uh, sent to Siberia and Russia, and, and so he was there primarily during the war, but he didn't speak much. So, um, but, um, I'd like to, to focus uh, primarily on my paternal grandfather, who um, was very, uh, he spoke tremendously about the Holocaust and about his time in Poland, and to the point where there was an author in the 1980s um, who was doing a lot of research, and he came across my uh, grandfather, his name was Solomon Lederberger, born in 1909, and uh, he said normally he would get Six tapes. Oh, if anyone doesn't know what tape, everyone knows what tapes are, right? Okay. Um, he, he like six tapes. He had like 28 tapes. He just went on and on. And many, many years later, I'd like to thank my father and my aunt uh, who came together and they, they took these tapes in Polish and German and, and, and it was, uh, and they, they compiled it into uh, a, a way that, you know, to a book that I can uh, uh, digest today and, and for, the, for our family. So this is about 10 years old. And this is uh, pr uh, primarily what I'm using for today's um, talk. So this is primarily taking uh, footage from what my grandfather witnessed. Uh, so they were in Tarnow, uh, born primarily to religious homes. Um, they drifted a little bit from that with their Zionistic, by their Zionistic pathways. But in o Opa, my, I, I call my grandfather Opa which is German for grandfather. And I, I'm grateful that I got a chance to know him. He died in 1993, 91, excuse me. Um, so in, in his book, he quotes uh, that he, he lived according to my logic, not by emotions. 
So you may want to keep that in mind as I speak. Um, he talks about even before the war, there was strong anti-Semitism. In his elementary school, the teachers called kids by their names. But except for Jewish children, he said, you little Jew from the first row, come here. So this is the environment he was in, but that was life. Um, he eventually worked as a, a master watchmaker with his father in a store in Tarnov, and they, were, they did quite well. He married in 1939, and uh, Felicia Graver, as Menachem, was born in 1940, a year later. So obviously 1939, uh, Poland is already invaded by the Nazis, and he, over chapters, are talking about all the new regulations. Uh, he kept a store, and, but he had a lot of uh, trials and tribulations. Uh, talks about eventually have to wear a Jewish star in his left arm, and not being allowed to walk on the main streets, not a lot of weight to walk on uh, sidewalks. Um, he talked about a flower incident because Jews weren't allowed to have good flour, and uh, he had a young kid at home. So one time he, he talks about a time he got some good flour he wanted to bring home, and some Gestapo uh, uh, soldiers uh, stopped him near where he lived, and they uh, found the flour and they. They beat him pretty badly, um, to the point where actually a gun was, uh, they were about to kill him, from what he describes. And he said, okay, okay, hold on, I'll, I'll tell you, if, if you spare me half an hour, I'll, I'll let you know where I got the flower. Because they wanted to know where he got the flower, and he refused to tell them. So he got a, he was told that he has a, about an hour. And so, it, just one of many, many uh, harrowing life and death decisions he had to make. But uh, basically, he, he talks about, he, uh, the fact that he had to tell the person who got him the flower indirectly that, to warn him to stop or going to find out about him. And they apparently was a little bit of a commotion, they were all upset, but he goes, pretty much it didn't matter because the first de deportation of Tarnov was just a few days later. So, um, so my Oma and Opa were fortunate to have ID cards. So this is a big deal, apparently. If you have some kind of card with the, uh, if you're a worker in the union uh, for the first deportation in 1942, in the summer of 42, uh, not everyone had these cards. His parents did not have his card. I think he had a sister did not have the card. And during the deportation, uh, he remarks how he thinks his father was fortunate who got shot in the spot. Um, in, in the, and then he said his mother was unfortunate because she was sent away, and it's along with the sister, never to be seen again. Um, he, re he reports the illusion that, uh, that maybe they were taken to, 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 to work, but he kind of um, found out from uh, doing some research that uh, all those Jews were not taken anywhere to work. They were, they were murdered. Uh, for my readings and our readings in the book as well, that day in June 1942, about 12,000 Jews from Tarnov were sent to their deaths. 6,000 were transported to a local forest that I believe my Aunt Felicia actually visited on a trip in the 1990s, and, and they were all buried in a mass grave there, and 3,000 were murdered in the city. So I know these are crazy numbers, but this is, this is what happened on that day that he witnessed. Um, so he survived that first deportation, um, and eventually uh, they, they got into the, and then they got to the Tarnov ghetto, and uh, the ghetto was sealed around that time, and he said he got into the ghetto within minutes of being required to get in there and he, with Oma and with his child, um, Felicia. And uh, they were desperate, to, everyone's desperate for, for, to survive, so you're desperate to work. And they think if you work, you're gonna survive, you get papers, you're gonna survive. And so um, uh, later he, he noted that the, the Gestapo were just giving uh, IDs and, and, and appropriate seals based on their moods. It, it was, there was no rhyme or reason for for anything, so there's tremendous fear, obviously, um, that we can't palpate. Um, so um, they eventually lived in the ghetto. They lived in this house with about 30 people were living there. They're um, obviously probably bunched in. And uh, I guess in those days, when you had a unit like that, you had a leader of the units. So my, my, my opa was in his 30s. I mean, he's a healthy guy, and he was um, took a, assumed the leadership role. And uh, one of the roles is to prepare for emergency. So he took upon himself to find a uh, hiding place because he figured there was going to be a second deportation. Again, he used his logic. And uh, so he found this crazy hiding place in the roof, fit for 30 people. And, uh, and then he talks about, 
he, told, he said you have to swear to be quiet, whatever. Obviously, there, in the next few days when the deportation, I assume, was getting near, there were like two, 300 people in this theater downstairs because the word got out. So he, instead of wishing them away, he uh, heroically decided to, he'd find a second hiding place in this, in this unit fit for all, I, we don't know, I think 200, maybe 300, I, I, we don't know for sure. But um, in the middle of the night, they were uh, f finding ways to feed these people and take away their excrements and all in the darkness. And, uh, this is as the second deportation was nearing. Um, and uh, that was in September of 1942. And uh, he, he did note this era of Rosh Hashanah, like you were saying, maybe it has something to do with the fact that it was Rosh Hashanah. Uh, the, the, so he, he, this is obviously difficult stuff to talk about, but he talks about, uh, to think about, I should say, that the Germans were going house to house this deportation, and, and the people were having to stay out all day, and the men, women, and children were separated, and uh, yes, horrific decisions were having to be made. Um, they, obviously, some people had IDs and stamps, and sometimes were, that's how they were decided where to go. Um, again, his logic tried to drive him, and he was asked, by people what they should do with their children because the children, they, I think they knew the children were being sent to death camps. And his logic said, you know, why give the Germans more victims? Um, leave the children. But when it came to his turn, um, that, that's not what happened. That's unexpected. All right. So anyway, um, they ended up three of them in a deportation line, um, and they were dear, geared to go to Auschwitz. I mean, it was it was it was going to happen. And uh, the trains uh, to Auschwitz, I guess, were all gone, and they were stuck in some stable overnight. And uh, and uh, again, they were together, which is a rare, rare, rare situation. And uh, the next day. Um, there was a list read out by the Gestapo, and uh, and, and their names were on it. And so um, they were released to go back to the ghetto. And so they never made it to Auschwitz, um, or wherever they were going. I don't know where they were going to go. But apparently, Opa found out later that uh, you know uh, that they were hiding some people that were um, prominent in, in the Jewish Council. So their family were in there. So I guess. Uh, apparently, the, the Germans are trying to freak out a little bit because uh, they, a lot of the Jews were being deported, and uh, including good workers. Um, and they were really wanted to have their watchmakers and whatnot. So I guess uh, one of the Jewish council members who could type for the Germans figured uh, that was a way to get them back in the ghetto. So that's how they survived that. Um, uh, so basically, uh, he says, we, we worked uh, as we believed nothing would happen to people who had to work because the Germans needed workers. So that's kind of what they did for some time after the deportation. And eventually they, they released all those people hiding in the, in the house. In the, they survived the second deportation, all those two, 300 people. Uh, the ghetto was liquidated, I guess, 43. I guess logic again told him he was going to die. He was destined to die. And, and so um, he figured he can't stick around. Uh, so the, the liquidation happened and the Germans uh, told everyone to come out with their, their, their bags. They told them to send them to labor. Uh, but uh, Opa found out they were going to keep 200 Jews in the ghetto to, uh, as a cleaning crew. You know. So of course there were more than 200 show up for this job and Opa uh, was luck, uh, you know, he was lucky, miraculously, was, was kept as a 200. And uh, all this time, by the way, um, I don't know if I mentioned, but he whisked off, he was able to get Oma and Felicia out of the ghetto uh, as living as Aryans in, in some small towns in Poland. He had some friends, he arranged it, a driver, I don't know how he did it, but um, they also had their trials and tribulations in these small, they're living as a Pole and Christian or Catholic. And obviously Felicia was very young um, and she obviously spilled the beans a couple times. 
So, you know, they had to move a lot, and they, uh, they, but they survived, and uh, I think they sent distress signals that they wanted to give up several times. Um, so, Opa mentions how he didn't let, eventually uh, he didn't have proper papers himself to leave. So, um, his plans changed a lot. Um, he, uh, he did find from a, he had a trusted Pole, Polish uh, a person I guess he knew about, that gave him this idea to get a railroad uniform uh, from a woman whose husband was on leave. And uh, he, I don't know, he also got hold of a bicycle. And uh, so he, had, he, he somehow got out of the ghetto uh, with a railroad uniform and, uh, and a bicycle, and he kind of bunched next to a 20, 30 people being let out by a guard, unnoticed. With, and I guess he had a jacket over himself at that point. He wasn't looking like a, a railroad guard. But, and, and then uh, the second he got out of the, of the ghetto, he says he took off his, or he opened, unbuckled his coat, he put on his cap, and he rode away. <laughs> and he, uh, he had ID papers that didn't say he was a railroad guard. He said he was like a silk manager or a silk factory. And, um, but he, he had to ride his bike not to Tarno if the train station was too dangerous, so he, he found another train station. And he, I don't know, he, he's amazing. He, he had someone meet him there that he must have arranged who slipped a, a ticket into his pocket for the train. And he, uh, and the, he got, he left his bicycle with us and he picked up at some point. And he, there were some crazy checkpoints that for some reason he didn't get uh, caught um, and not noticed. Um, he also mentioned how during his train ride, he was just his legs were tickling, quote unquote, with all the fleas he brought from the ghetto, and they were just caught in this rubber band that you know he had to let go once in a while, but he couldn't do it in the train because that you know would not be a good idea. Um, once in Warsaw, you know he went to he made he took the train to Warsaw, and his wife Oma and Felicia were hiding in Warsaw in a, as a pole, and uh, they were shocked that he was there. They, I mean, he, he describes that they thought he was dead and. And the first order of business, um, I'm, I'm happy to say, he, he arranged for a bottle of vodka to be delivered uh, to celebrate. And they lived in, in Warsaw as, as um, non-Jewish Poles for some time, and, um, and he had connections to the underground there as well. I mean, there were a fair, he described there were a fair amount of Jews who were living, uh, I don't know, a fair amount, but there were a handful of Jews living, and they knew, and the, he talks about, um, he, he went ahead and pretended to be a, a railroad Polish worker, and he had the uniform, he, and he eventually got hold of a uh, ID, this, uh, of a good ID that it said, the pass, uh, not passport, but like some papers that said his name was Andrzej Bielecki. It was actually meant for somebody else. But uh, they didn't, it didn't work out for them, and so he got it, and, and uh, so he, that was his name, Andrzej Bielecki, from Solomon Lederberger. And uh, so he lived as an Aryan, and uh, he got around as a, as a railroad worker, and uh, let's see, I'm sorry. He also talked about the Poles. I mean, there was some, a lot of the Poles knew there were Jews living, and they, they all sought out the Jews because they figured, and you know, these were war times, I, they figured if they found a Jew, I mean, instead of maybe bringing them together, they would threaten to send them, but they also knew they had money. I mean, some of them had hidden jewelry. And, uh, my opa had some jewelry on them and some money, and they always were bribed to get uh, to give up some money. So, he does mention there were some righteous Poles, of course, that helped out and helped color their hair and show them how to live therein. Um, anyway, he goes on to, in 1944, the Warsaw Uprising, the Germans, apparently, in the, I'm sorry, um, the Russians, I guess, and, and the Americans were closing in. There was some sense that there was, the war was coming, I guess, to a close. And uh, he saw the Germans actually retreating at one point and he was joining the Poles and yelling at them and throwing rotten eggs. I'm glad he said rotten eggs, but I figured they wouldn't use good eggs. Um, but I guess the Nazis realized, and I'm not a historian, that the, the Russians stopped short of coming into Warsaw for about months and months, and the order came in from Berlin for them to just crush Warsaw. So that's apparently what happened, and, and the Germans just t destroyed Warsaw, and and all, and they evacuated a lot of the Poles westward, and Oma and Opa were caught in this, and Felicia, again, they were together almost on and off this during this time. They took two suitcases, they headed west, and they ended up in some transit camp, and there's some crazy stories, which I'm not gonna, but um, they were separated, and then they were reunited. Um, they were, this, this they're, again, they're not going, they're not separated, they're not 
the refugees of Jews, now they're, they're Polish refugees. Um, Opa apparently pleaded with a, a German guard at one point to get back, and the German guard agreed. Um, but they were separated again, apparently, because Oma and Opa were allowed to leave this um, transit camp, and Opa was destined to go to a labor camp in Germany. That was the plan. And, uh, he, and over, uh, so he was instructed to act sick, and he did apparently a very good job, and uh, they were gonna send to the infirmary, but eventually they opened the door, and all these people were faking to be sick. They let all these people go, and he was all of a sudden in the middle of nowhere, lost by himself. He's, and he, he didn't, and he had no idea how to get a hold of his wife and child. And he talks about just stumbling around, and he saw an electric train stuck in a uh, in the middle of a field filled with people. The electricity was, I guess, off. And he uh, he boarded the train, and Oman Oba on the train. <laughs> okay, so uh, I heard this growing up, but it's just. Um, so eventually, you know, they eventually made their way to the country. Again, the refugees, they went from farm to farm looking for a place to live. They had, you know, they eventually found some peasant farmers who took him in. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long they were there, but I believe they were there for quite some time where they housed Oma, Felicia, and Opa. But oh, they, by the way, Opa never was the husband. He was the uncle uh, to Oma, and I was the uncle to Felicia because they were afraid, uh, they had different papers and Felicia's story is remarkable obviously she didn't know that this man Opa my, my Opa was her father until after the war in fact she didn't know she was Jewish um, until after the war because she got so uh, you know you know her so trained uh, by Oma and Opa uh, they talk about how they lived like a peasant in peasant farm conditions for many for until the war was over and uh, I'm not gonna go and anyway, they eventually made their way to uh, to Lutz or to Sopo, where my father was born after the war. He, um, and uh, I remember one scene is he talks about seeing uh, some, uh, his, let me find it. it was, sorry, it was like five or six, he saw for the first time, he saw five or six emaciated, emaciated uh, Jews coming from the Holocaust, concentration camp. And uh, I guess this, he's on the Russian side now because I guess this is, not the American, but he said that they just looked, were, obviously was shocking. He, he took them in, he sheltered them, he actually knew one of them. Uh, he gave them quote unquote first aid by giving them a roof, some nourishment, clothing, he took drapes and made clothing for them. He admitted one of the hospital, he, he said the Russians weren't very helpful with concentration camp victims as the as Western armies were. But as you can see, I mean, his story is, is remarkable. Uh, fortunate to be alive, I was fortunate uh, for him to, to survive and, and, and uh, and I was fortunate to, to get to know him. And um, there were a lot of people along the way that, that um, were, my dad said, were angels. And you can't say it was just one person. It wasn't, there were religious Jews that were in the story that were amazing. There were secular Jews, there were Poles, there were Germans. Um, you know, there were, uh, so um, I hope you was able to appreciate the, the story today. Thank you. In December 1941, along with thousands of other Jews in Riga, Latvia, Dubnow was murdered by the Nazis. His final words were, Jews, if you survive, never forget what is happening here. Write and rewrite. Yiddin, schreit, or schreit. Unlike my fellow speakers, I'm not a child or even a grandchild of survivors, but I too am here to bear witness. I'm Ashkenazi on my mother's side, and Sephardi on my father's side. Showcasing the scope of the Shoah, relatives were lost on both. Kaya Rimmer Schreibman from Tolchin, Ukraine, born under the Russian Tsar, an aunt of my maternal grandmother, Lillian Rubin of blessed memory, was murdered in 1942 at the Peshawar concentration camp in Ukraine. Oslan Cohen from Istanbul, Turkey, born under the Ottoman Sultan, an uncle of my paternal grandfather. Dr. Rene Isaac Amon Alaba was deported in 1943 from Drancy, France, to Auschwitz, where he ultimately perished. Professionally, I serve as Director of Academic Research at Jewish Heritage Alliance, cultural and historical platform dedicated to preserving and promoting the Sephardic legacy. I'm also a lawyer with a PhD in law and comparative criminal procedure and a background in international criminal justice. 
such as war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. The experience has included a legal fellowship at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague and hoping to compile a dossier documenting the war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by ISIS members. In this vein, as some of you may know, Benjamin Ferenz, seen here, the last living prosecutor of the Nuremberg Trials, who led the prosecution of the Einsatz group and at the age of 27, the SS squads who murdered over a million Jews in the Holocaust by bullets, passed on in his sleep during Passover on Friday night, April 7th, at the age of 103. As a law student, I had the extraordinary honor of meeting him. May the soul of Beryl Ben Yosef, the sorrow, have an aliyah in repose on high. Now, traditional Holocaust studies long focused on the Ashkenazi Jewish presence in Central and Eastern Europe, shattered by the Nazi genocide. Little attention was given to vibrant, ancient, and long settled Sephardi communities, which were targeted by the Nazis as well. This Sephardic legacy has tragically been overlooked in mainstream discourse and consciousness. So many people, Jews and non-Jews alike, don't know that Sephardic Jews were impacted in the Shoah. In Europe, Sephardic communities ranged from France and the Netherlands and the Northwest to the Balkan countries of Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Greece in the Southeast. The leading cities there were Sofia, Belgrade, Sarajevo, and Salonika. And it's a little hard to see, but um, they're all in this uh, area. The 700,000 Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews in North Africa and the Levant were saved in part due to timing and geography, the Allied invasions of North Africa, Operation Torch, and growing military triumphs over the Nazis, symbolized by Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery's victory in Egypt over Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps. At the Second Battle of El Alamein in November 1942, 250 miles from the Suez Canal and a mere 70 miles from Alexandria, whose Jews had resided there since classical antiquity, uh, that victory was decisive. It ended Nazi plans for Jews not yet in their grasp, including in the land of Israel. But nonetheless, Jews in Africa were sent to labor in internment camps, racially discriminatory laws were imposed, and some were deported to the death camps on mainland Europe as well. Now, during my visits to several Holocaust museums around the country, I discovered virtually none mentioned these stories. And some staff members have never even heard of Jewish communities in these places, including Salonika, Greece. And therefore, it's very meaningful to share the largely unknown story in brief of Jewish Salonika, known as the Jerusalem of the Balkans, the hub of the Ladino-speaking civilization, and a symbol of nearly total annihilation. Salonika, or Thessaloniki in Greek, was founded in the fourth century BCE by King Cassander. He named this metropolis after his wife, the sister of the conqueror of classical antiquity, Alexander the Great, who's depicted in this mosaic. Since at least the first century of the Common Era, when the Second Temple, or Beit HaMikdash, stood, Jews had lived there. Yet the city's splendor did not fully arise until the Sephardic arrival in the late 15th century, following the 1492 edict of expulsion from Spain and 1497 forced conversions in Portugal. In the late 15th century, as the map shows, the unity of the Sephardic people uh, living in Spain and Portugal was torn asunder, and a global diaspora began with tens of thousands of Sephardic Jews departing Spain. Half went to Portugal, here, plus the other half ventured across the Mediterranean to Italy, North Africa, the Levant, so Syria, and Lebanon into Iraq, the land of Israel, and of course into the Balkans up in here in southeastern Europe. Many came to Salonika, joining Romanio or Byzantine Jews who had been there for centuries, and Ashkenazi Jews who had already begun to arrive in the 1370s, fleeing persecution in the Holy Roman Empire. Over succeeding decades and centuries, Iberian arrivals, including crypto Jews or conversos who were persecution by the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions transformed this great port city on the shores of the Aegean Sea so significantly that it became their religious and cultural hub known as the Jerusalem of the Balkans and in Ladino or Judeo-Spanish as the mother of Israel, the Madre de Israel, a term coined by Samuel Ushke, a 16th century Iberian refugee, over 30 distinctive synagogues, each named for a place of origin like Castile and Aragon, Calabria Yashan, Monasterlis and Portugal coexisted alongside each other. And by the 20th century, Jews constituted nearly half of the city population, while the port even closed on Shabbat. The community included merchants, small tradesmen, boatmen, porters, pharmacists, doctors, waiters, and industrialists. 
own soap factories, textile plants, and flour mills. Ladino, the Sephardic equivalent to Yiddish, was the lingua franca. The city's Jewish life was well known. Among others, there was the Matanot of Yonin, the Torah of Ma'a, the Alatinian of a lot of orphanages, the Hirsch Hospital, and the Modiano home for the elderly. Now, in the first Balkan War, 1912 to 13, a year before World War I, Greece captured the city from the crumbling Ottoman Empire, which had controlled it, Salonika, since 1430. The Times of London reported that upon arrival into the city, Sephardic Jews were robbed of their watches, purses, and similar objects of value. Any attempt at resistance was met by personal violence. The Times of Paris, Le Ton de Paris, observed that many Jews were maltreated, brutalized, and robbed, stores were pillaged, and synagogues wrecked. In 1917, a massive fire destroyed two-thirds of the entire city and reduced much of the Jewish community to ruins. 70,000 people, including over 50,000 Jews, were rendered homeless, while synagogue schools and businesses went up in the conflagration. Many Jews left the city, whilst others stayed to reconstruct the community. In June 1931, deadly anti-Semitic riots broke out at Camp Campbell, the Jewish neighborhood, and side of a former British military barracks, hence the name. It was burnt to the ground. Yet at trial, the defendants were acquitted, spurring even further Jewish immigration. Yet as World War II began, about 50,000 Sephardic Jews still call Salonika home. Now, in October 1940, during World War II, Nazi Germany's ally, fascist Italy, led by Benito Mussolini, invaded Greece. Greek forces, including Jewish citizens, resisted for months, and many died, including Colonel Mordechai Friesis, the first senior Greek officer killed in action. Upon Greece's surrender, to the Axis in 1941, the Axis powers Germany, Italy, and Bulgaria created zones of occupation, which uh, the map shows. Uh, the red is uh, the German occupation, the uh, brown and yellow here is Italian, and this green is Bulgarian. So Italy took southern Greece and the islands, Bulgaria got Thrace or eastern Macedonia, and Germany took Macedonia and northern Greece, including Salonika. On April 9th, 1941, the Nazis entered Salonika. The Holocaust in this city was effectively carried out in three stages, deliberately designed to lull Jews into a state of complacency with the aim of total destruction. And I apply the description of this man, Dr. Isaac Aaron Matarasso, a physician and eyewitness. Part one, period of partial tolerance. Part two, the period of persecution. And part three, the period of destruction. And so going in order, beginning with part one, on April 11th, two days after the Nazi arrival, the last Ladino newspaper in the world printed in the Hebrew Rashi script, El Messiero, was closed. While anti Semitic newspapers were created within days, Jews were barred from entering cafes, pastry shops, and the communal council was arrested. In May, Jews were compelled to hand in radios. Operation Rosenberg, a special task force designed to plunder Jewish cultural heritage, such as treasures and artifacts from across Europe, commenced in Salonika. Jews were insulted and occasionally arrested, yet the Nuremberg Law, stripping Jews of citizenship and regulating access to professions on the basis of race or descent, were not yet formally applied. And while the winter of 1941 to 42 was rather vicious, with hundreds of Jews succumbing to hypothermia and disease, including children, the situation still appeared bearable for most of the community. Part two. The beginning of the persecution came on Shabbat, July 11th, 1942, known as Black Saturday. All Jewish males aged 18 to 45 had to present themselves at Liberty Square, the Plantilla of Ferris. About 9,000 men showed up and were forced to perform humiliating exercises before the SS under the broiling sun for hours without water. If they fainted or grew weary, they were beaten. 2,000 were conscripted into forced labor battalions and sent to work on roads and mountains across Greece, where many succumbed to inhumane conditions. This sparked a great upheaval in the midst of the community, remembered the survivor, Eric Acuno. Why did the Nazis want the young men? What would they do to them? And what would they do to us? The community negotiated with the German administrator of the city, Max Merton, in exchange for releasing the men a huge ransom of two and a half billion drachmas, perhaps close to $100 million, had to be paid. And while some of this amount, perhaps most, was raised in the Salonika and Athens Jewish communities, the remainder was settled by handing over to the city of Salonika the 500-year-old Jewish cemetery, which contained 350,000 graves spread across 80 football fields. In other words, having tortured the living, as Dr. Matarasso noted, the Germans then turned to the dead, and they ordered the destruction of the cemetery. 
On December 6, 1942, obliteration began. Tombstones dating to the 15th century were demolished or uprooted and utilized for building materials and projects across the city, including renovating churches, paving streets, and lining latrines. The municipality, long coveting the space that sat at the center of the city, played an active role in this profound desecration. Today, the Aristotle University, the largest in the Balkans, sits atop the ruins of the Jewish cemetery. Part three, much worse was to come. As Professor Cecil Roth, the Oxford historian and editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia Judaica put it, by the beginning of 1943, the mechanism had been prepared, the preliminaries had been finished, the time had now arrived for the acceleration of the persecution. And in the, and in the course of six months, between February and August of 1943, Salonic and Jewry met its doom. The period of destruction began on February 6, 1943, when Aloy Bruner and Dieter Bislicheni, two of Adolf Eichmann's deputies, arrived in the city. On February 8th at noon on Monday, Eric Acuna remembered, despair gripped the Jewish population, for the Germans decided to impose the Nuremberg laws. All Jews were now required to put a yellow star in every piece of clothing they wore. Jews were not allowed to use public transportation, and they had to move to areas the SS had specified. The creation of these ghettos marked the first time in the history of the city that any existed, which meant Jews were forced to abandon their houses and apartments. And any Jews arrested outside the ghetto after curfew would be instantly shot. In March, the Baron Hirsch Quarter, donated in the 1890s by Clara de Hirsch, the widow of the philanthropist Maurice de Hirsch, located next to the train station and built to house Jews fleeing pogroms from Eastern Europe, was cruelly and rather perversely transformed into a transit camp from which the Jews of Salonika would be sent via freight cars to their deaths in Poland. Under threat of severe punishment or death, Jews were compelled to declare all their movable and fixed assets while fences were erected around the Baron Hirsch quarter to prevent escape. Chief Rabbi Dr. Tzvi Korit, an Ashkenazi, a controversial figure to this day, said not to trust the impending rumors of liquidation. Jews from Salonika were to be resettled in Krakow. It seems he was told the plan was to restructure the community into an autonomous entity. But for whatever reason, he encouraged people to remain and not to escape. And this is in stark contrast to the Chief Rabbi Elias Barzillai of Athens, who burnt the communal membership records and urged everyone to flee, thereby saving most of the Athens Jewish by 1943, as this map shows, the final solution to the Jewish question, the euphemistic phrase for the Shoah, the Korban, the Holocaust, was in full operation across the European continent, with Jews being shipped to the death camps in Poland. And this is a Korslanica, you can't even see it. To the very bottom of this map, and you can see the extensive train rides that were taken through the Balkans all the way up into Poland. And on March 15th, the first of 19 convoys with 2,800 men, women, and children, including Erika Cunho, left for Poland. Five days later, they arrived down in Krakow, but Auschwitz, joining Jews from across Europe. The willingness to believe they would be resettled even led some Greek Jews to exchange Greek drachmas, Polish slotis. It was unfathomable to believe that Germany was exterminating human beings. As Yom Tov Yakowal, president of B'nai B'rith, and the community's legal advisor who perished at Birkenau, wrote in a posthumously published memoir, let no twisted minds come and tell me that it was already known that the Germans intended to send all of us to the crematoria. Not even our great grandfathers read such a thing in history. Every few days, another convoy with a comparable number of Jews was deported to Poland. Agonizing words provided a glimpse of the fear of this future. On March 21st, 1943, Serena Saltiel heartbreakingly wrote to her son Maurice, what else can I tell you besides the slow agony we're going through? Three trains have already left, filled with unimaginable suffering. This might be the last letter I write to you. I bless you, may the Lord keep you. If the Lord grants me the joy of seeing you again one day, I wouldn't know how to bow down before him. I send you tender kisses. A physical reunion was not to be. Serena, along with most of the other family members, died at Auschwitz. On March 23rd, 1943, Archbishop Damaskinos of Athens and all Greece formally protested the deportations to the Prime Minister and the Nazi leadership declaring, I have spoken to the Lord and made up my mind to save as many Jewish souls as possible. 29 leading figures from the arts, law, business, and academic worlds co-signed this letter, which he officially published. There is no similar document issued openly to the Nazi occupiers on behalf of Jews anywhere else in Europe. This is a unique moment. He ordered 
the Greek Orthodox Church to further issue fake baptismal certificates and identity papers and to hide all Jews that they could. Yad Vashem posthumously recognized him as righteous among the nations in 1969. Notwithstanding the Archbishop's extraordinary protest, the deportations continued. Leon Parahia's memories of his early days in Auschwitz were marked by feelings of confusion and ignorance. Parahia, who arrived at Auschwitz on April 16, 1943, mere days before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began, did not understand the gravity of having been separated from his parents during the selection process, believing them to still be alive. He soon learned their true fate. An older man from Salonika visited his barracks and said, my brothers, to all the new arrivals, do not think about your parents or your children for they have all been burnt. If you don't believe me, go to the windows of the door, or the door. You'll see flames billowing out of the chimneys. They'll smell the odor of burnt flesh. They believed he was insane until they saw the crematorium. Pariah was speechless, and along with others, spontaneously began to sing the Ladino folk song or ballad, Mama. And this act of solidarity uniting the group through their ancestral Ladino tongue, as well as the language of music, moved everyone to tears. Leon was among the few Greek Jews who survived, for by summer of 1943, the entire Salonika community had virtually been annihilated. Greek Jewish experiences in concentration camps were largely shaped by this unique linguistic background, because in the earliest days in Auschwitz, their lack of German proved isolating and potentially life-threatening. Even nominal knowledge could mean the difference between life and death, and because many Greek Jews did not know German or Yiddish, but they spoke Ladino and Greek, sometimes French, they mostly could not communicate with other Jews either. And the Nazis exploited this linguistic isolation. The Greeks were often utilized as under commandos. Special units picked for youth and health who were forced to dispose of the corpses from the gas chambers and the crematoria. And this photo is one of only four secretly taken by members of the Zonder commando, showing the corpses being burnt in the actual moment in an attempt to destroy the evidence. The pathological Nazi hatred of Jews continued so that even by summer 1944, Aware the Allies were rapidly advancing and that Nazi Germany was losing the war, the Nazis diverted resources and personnel from the war front so more, more Jews could be deported. Indeed, the last remaining intact Ashkenazi and Sephardi communities in Europe were deported to Auschwitz nearly simultaneously. Immediately after Jews in Budapest, where Raoul Wallenberg saved so many, were transported there, the Nazis rounded up throughout the Ionian and Aegean seas small and ancient and flourishing Sephardic and Romano communities on islands, including Corfu and Leros and the Ionian Sea. Um, in fact, on Leros there was one Jew, Daniel Rachman, the Nazi sent a ship to pick him up. He was deported and died in Auschwitz. And uh, in the Aegean Sea, it was Chios, Crete, Kos, and Rhodes, where Jews had been present since the time of the Maccabees. The Hashmani, in a mere 11 miles from neutral Turkey. In September 1944, the final convoy of Dutch Jews from Western Bork in the Netherlands were deported to Auschwitz, including the diarist Anne Frank and her family. On October 7, 1944, facing certain death like the fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April 1943, the Zonder Commando staged a revolt in Auschwitz. They blew up crematorium four using an explosive smuggled out by women who worked in a nearby factory. They managed to kill three SS men and injure a dozen led by Joseph Baruch, the senior, a young Greek officer from Yanina. 250 Zonder commandos were killed, including dozens of Greek Jews. 200 more were summarily executed. The four women involved, whose names we should remember, Esther uh, uh, Rosa uh, Robota, Esther Weichblum, Ala Gertner, and Regina Safishtin. They were identified and tortured for months, perhaps even sexually assaulted, but they revealed no names of anyone else who was complicit in the conspiracy. On January 6, 1945, mere weeks before the Soviet army liberated Auschwitz, they were publicly hanged. In their final moments, they cried, Hazak be Amats, be strong and of good courage. And they sang the Hatikwa national anthem, still believing in a better future. Marcel Najari, one of the few surviving Zonder commandos, buried his notes taken at the time of the revolt, or written at the time, inside a bottle near crematorium four in 1944. They were recovered in 1980 after his death, and digital technology in 2017 permitted 90% of the writing to be legible. Part of it reads, almost always when they kill, I ask myself if God exists, and nevertheless, I have always believed in him, 
And I still believe that God wants his will to be done. For about four years now, they've been killing Jews. They killed Poles, Czechs, French, Hungarians, Slovaks, Dutch, Belgians, Russians, Salonikans, or Thessalonians, and Greeks from Athens, and Arta, and Corfu, and Kos, and Rhodes. A total of around 1.4 million Jews have been killed. This is strikingly close to the accepted consensus. Dario Gabay, the last known living Zonder Commando, died in Los Angeles in 2020, age 97. Of a 50,000 strong population in 1941, less than 4%, or 2,000 people, from the Salonican community survived. A 96% death rate. The survivors included Melissa and Sarah Borla, the parents of Albert, the current CEO of Pfizer. The Jerusalem of the Balkans, the mother of Israel, the mother of Israel, had lasted for four and a half centuries, and the obliteration took less than 30 months. The founders of the Sephardic community of Salonika had fled the Spanish and Portuguese expulsions and inquisition, arrived in a place of refuge and planted a garden, tenderly nurtured and cared for over centuries. It was denuded and exterminated. It's estimated the Nazis murdered up to 50% of Sephardic Jewry in Europe, including in Sarajevo and Belgrade and elsewhere. A Ladino verse expresses the magnitude of the calamity. I would like to write my remembrances, but I would need a sea of ink and a sky for the paper. All that Salonic and Jewry represented, that island of 15th century Sephirod, right, or Spain, Portugal, Iberia, and the 20th century that's gone forever, as was a remarkable way of life. A tiny remnant lives on today around the globe, including in Salonica, about 1,200 people, or 1,200 Jews still live there. But the glory that was Jewish Greece and the grandeur that was Salonica exists today only in memory. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, on this day we honor the survivors. The living and the departed is meaningfully done by their children this evening. We remember the victims, the six million Jewish men, women, and children. We mourn for all that died with them, their goodness and their wisdom, their learning and their laughter. The world has become a poorer place, and our hearts think of the magnificence that might have been and a future that will never be. We think of this and lament our loss, and yet, as Rabbi Bogopolsky alluded to in the beginning, from the painful thought that they are physically no more, we call for comfort upon the memory of what they were. And we resolve to continue their legacy as, again, unexpectedly, so much has occurred in these past 80 years in terms of revitalizing the Jewish people. To cherish this gift of life preserved amidst the depths of such destruction obligates us all to remember and to not forget. This commandment is repeated in the Torah nearly 170 times. We cannot change the past, but we can remember these names and their stories, including those of Sephardic Jews. We owe it to past and future generations, for these echoes will undoubtedly continue to resound until the last syllable of recorded time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isaac. Thank you very much, Fabric, who came this evening and uh, light a candle, like a memorial candle you have, if you haven't lit one yet. And might we all get together at better times. Thank you. Uh, that's all.